Excellent. Preparation for this talk. Well, I started making this talk when I realized that after a while people stopped reading the Snowden documents. Because actually in the beginning, it's June 2013, there was a lot of attention. But then because of commercial reasons, the Intercept wanted to create this business model, this, this, the journalists, and they started trickling documents. And after like a year, people lost interest, but very interesting information came out. And so that's why most cryptographers or technology people actually have not looked at all the documents and what it actually means. They just know it's bad. Okay, so I'll try to see uh, what's happening. If I have time left, I will also discuss specifically the crypto because this is what this workshop is about. Before I forget, actually, in two weeks, for those of you who like GDPR, there was actually a crypto policy workshop because there was a big lawyer at privacy conference in Brussels, um, January 25 to 27, and the two days before there will be crypto policy workshop. And there was actually one session on crypto and GDPR. And a lawyer will be sharing it, so it will not be cryptographers making incompetent statements about law, like me, when I say something. So it will be actually a lawyer sharing this panel. Um, and there will be some people from the commission, hopefully, and ENISA and so on. So if you want to find out more, it would be a very good place. And you can find the leaflet outside there. Harry and I are working on the program. I think it should be out in one or two days. We should have a skeleton out. Good. Uh, so I guess you know, the nice thing about the Snowden documents is that everybody knows about the NSA. And I can talk about the NSA to my family and to my non-crypto colleagues in the building without being looked at as a complete lunatic person who's paranoid and whatever. That's a, a very big difference. Um, I guess we also see that the NSA has failed miserably at protecting the information because they lose hundreds of thousands of documents, which is kind of amazing, right? That, and the British are very upset with them about this because a lot of the documents are British documents, GCHQ documents. So it actually did change something, at least I can talk about the penalty parties, I can talk now about my job about the NSA. Summarizing the documents, I think Snowden made a very good summary which says, collect it all, know it all, and exploit it all. And especially for the last part, we actually learned some new stuff this year as well. We'll come back to that. There will be new slides. So the summary is that, well, you know, if you've been to crypto, um, they used to try to stop crypto. Um, at some moment, they used to send beautiful women to crypto who spoke nine languages to try to, you know, get involved with cryptographers and so on. With very interesting days, I guess. Ryan was still around, we were both too young to be of, to be of interest in those women, of course, but... Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so now interesting times. But, and of course, we, you could go to the NSA Museum and look at their parking lots. You could read uh, the Puzzle Palace, there were books about the NSA. So in that sense, we knew most of it, but still the scale surprised most of us. How sophisticated they are, organizational and technical. The fact that they have offense in depth. From the Snowden documents, we know the NSA had three independent ways of getting at Google's data. Okay. And of course, not only the NSA, I want more slides about that. Industry was also involved, widely. I can have more slides about this. And I think also there is hard evidence this is used for industrial espionage. I mean, think Boeing versus Airbus, uh, but think in general European economy, economic interests, or non US economic interests. And of course, also in the mind of crypto standards, which is something cryptographers should be really upset about that US government money. Um, is used to make it harder to write standards and to actually open that standard. So, the thing that got the least attention, I think, at the time in 2013, was actually active defense. And active defense is a euphemism. It actually means we're going to hack everybody. Right? That's very different from trying to break crypto, it's just hack everybody. Um, and one of the simple techniques to hack people actually um, is the quantum program, and one is quantum insertion. And most people haven't even heard of this because Quantum insertion was leaked in November 2013, and after five months, more people tuned out. And so here's a quantum slide. It has nothing to do with post-quantum crypto or quantum. You should only read one thing on this slide, which is the propagation delay from tip to target determines the success rate of the network. So what is quantum insertion? If you type facebook.com or google.com or microsoft.com in your browser, the NSA answers before Google. And so they actually, it's not Google answer. You get the NSA answer. And of course, this page doesn't have Google.com, but it actually has malware. You take control of your machine um, using their sophisticated malware. And from now on, your machine is owned by the NSA. So it's just being on the network and being faster than Google. Of course, you can detect this because after a while, Google.com real answer arrives. So ISPs, if they would want to, they could protect you. I don't know whether they do it. I think the fact that this slide is out may mean that the NSA may do it less. Because it's a bit of a risk. It's known as a technique. And if you spot two answers, one may be from the NSA. There is much more about this, but I guess it just shows you what kind of things they do, how amazing they are, right? I mean, Google is amazing, 
because they're very fast, well, the NSA is fast. Okay. So, of course, there's also all the attacks on devices, I'll come back to that. But more or less, in the 80s, there was this Dolph Yahoo paper, which says that you know, there was a protocol adversary, and in fact, Alice doesn't talk to Bob, she talks to the adversary, and the adversary can delete messages, can inject messages, can change messages. Well, this adversary exists and is called the NSA. They have complete control over the network, even if your machine is never on the internet. No longer deniable, the British kept denying it for a long time, they now, then they, at some moment they start producing the same statement always. And I say in the beginning denied it, and then in the end they kind of, you know, gave up on it. So I, it, I think it's clear, but this is actually all real, it's happening, these documents have been confirmed, and Max Schramm's even one is court case based on it. So, I attended a workshop in Cambridge, in one of the first protocol workshops organized by, by Roger Needham and Ross Anderson, and Bob Morris, who was the head of um, crypto department at the NSA gave a talk, he's actually the father of the guy who wrote the Internet War, the 1988 Internet War. And he said many interesting things, which I only understood later, but one of the first things he said is, rule number one is look for plain text. Because actually people don't encrypt. And it's a bit better as we'll see today, but of course it's still not enough encryption and this follows up. If you use encryption, you're a special person. So, where can you get your data? Um, I guess we all knew in Europe about Perception. There was an echelon study where there was a British journalist made a lot of noise about the fact that the British and the Americans, in general five eyes, British, Americans, Canadians, Australians, New Zealand, were eavesdropping on satellite communication. And a big report happened in the European Parliament, arrived in the European Parliament, unfortunately a few days after 9-11, so nobody paid attention. We had other worries than the echelon report, but more or less, this is a very famous slide about the prison program, where more or less um, there is also the upstream program, which means inter intercept all communications. But the famous part of the slide is the yellow bubble, which says you should use both. Don't be happy with just everything you intercept. You should also get the data in the cloud. And this is maybe also why there is no great enthusiasm for social encryption in the cloud. Because if you have social encryption in the cloud, you can no longer use a prism program. Okay? So, if you are an Apple user, you can be very happy because Apple was the last company to join the program, 2012, mm -hmm. and Microsoft was first. Mm -hmm. At least according to this slide, we don't know whether it's correct. But all your other favorite companies are in there, so if your data is in the cloud, it adds up with the NSA. We don't know what the interface is, we don't know what the volume mm -hmm. is, um, but at least some documents claim that the interface is real time. We don't know about this, but at least it's very interesting this is a slide that made Google very upset because of the smiley. So because Google was very nice and encrypted everything from your browser to the Google front end, but actually in their back office, between all their servers, everything was unencrypted. And what happened was that, of course, this was communication very often on US soil, so the NSA could not intercept this. But then they asked GCH2, their British friends, um, to intercept this communication, which was in clear text, and to quote uh, Bruce Schneier, if your network operator, in this case level 3, has an NSA code name, in this case little, then you're screwed. And so Google was screwed because all this was in clear and was intercepted uh, and collected. Okay, so now you know two ways of which the NSA would access to Google data. They asked for it at prison or they got it between uh, the back of stock. I'm told by some people who can know that this is now all encrypted, that some companies sell encryption boxes made a lot of money in the years following this very often the discussion is, can you intercept everything? Well, this is a very interesting slide that says, in the Bahamas and the second country, all phone calls are fully intercepted and stored. Not only who calls whom, but also the content of communication. And this is, of course, 2013 or 2012, so maybe today is even more countries have joined the club, where you get full recovery, so if you forgot what you said, you can contact the NSA and they can give you the recording. Um, to give you an idea of speeds, this is 2009, okay, this is nine years ago now. So the GCHQ plans a tap of 17 terabits per second and then they have a filter there because of course most of us send each other pictures of cats or videos of cats and you don't want to store all those in multiples. So we actually filter them out and only about one in five bits, 20%, only something like two or three <coughs> terabits is collected. Okay? And this, is, this is eight years ago or nine years ago. Right? So you can imagine what they do now. And of course, Every cipher takes a file and goes to Utah, where the, the, the 
research data center where they collect all the ciphertext just in case their quantum computer finally gets done. Okay, so if you send ciphertext, your data will be backed up by the NSA. This is something you know for sure. Skype, I guess Brian should just close his eyes because Skype was actually mentioned as peer-to-peer -peer by Dan, I think, and by Estonian guys. Peer-to-peer -peer was European. It was not open, and there were some troubles with law enforcement who couldn't access the polls. But so what happened is that in February 2011, the NSA to the Fisk Court acquired a bill to intercept Skype in and Skype out connection, which means if you would call from Skype to the fixed network or the mobile network. And then in a couple of months later, in May, Microsoft bought Skype for eight and a half billion. In the stolen documents, it says that one month later, the NSA acquired Skype peer-to-peer -peer interception. And maybe no correlation to that, maybe completely random, but maybe it's not. We don't know. Any Skype users here? You use Skype on multiple devices? Mm -hmm. You know what happens? These messages keep coming back. Right? It's like if you sit on your phone and the message you sent on your PC yesterday comes up, the NSA has a tool for this. Because they also find it very annoying, and there is actually a tool. Here's a guide for Prism Skype collection. But they actually have a tool which you can read in detail how they eliminate double messages between desktops and mobile phones. <laughs> 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 It's quite credible, right? And you can look up all the documents. I'm not making this up. Okay. So then we have traffic data. Who talks to whom? So this is called in NSA speak <coughs> dial number recognition. Because it comes from the phone days when you wanted to find out who was phoned. So the other stuff was DNI, digital network intelligence or information. So who talks to whom? It's metadata, traffic data, which URLs who you visit, who you send email to, um, and of course with those devices where you are. Your location is also metadata, which is correct. And of course, one of the first documents revealed by the Snowden team was the fact that the NSA was also spying on Americans. Verizon was collecting, uh, or was giving to the NSA, millions of phone records today. And so you should understand that in America there is a Fourth Amendment, which means the right against unreasonable search and seizure. It means the NSA cannot collect information of US citizens or people of US soil unless the, circ the circumstances. But so it turns out that like had been done in the past, they were exposed in the past doing the same thing. They were actually collecting metadata from the US citizens. Now, the Europeans were very outraged about this. The Americans were outraged because they expect the NSA to spy on all of you, except for Brian and also Harry's American, so that's okay. You, know, you have civil rights, all the rest is no human rights. You can spy on me when I'm over here. Yeah, okay. When you're, but in the US, you actually, but it's very different between Right. Europe has universal human rights, organized universal human rights. The US believes it only applies to US citizens. And I should still see the late Casper Bowden. He showed once a video of a US senator who couldn't stop laughing when somebody suggested otherwise, that anybody outside the US could actually have human rights. And he found it so funny, he couldn't stop laughing. It's a fantastic <laughs> video to, to give the message across. Okay. Now, the Europeans, they were outraged. But then we have the Data Retention Directive, which actually tells all our operators to do exactly the same thing all your data, who you call, where you are, which, to whom you send email, which website you visit, is all stored by your ISP or operator. Okay? Interesting enough, some people read all the nice laws that Engineering showed you, and they went to the highest European court, European Court of Justice, and they won their case. And what did the countries do? They said, oh, it's a political problem. We're going to tweak the law a bit, because in fact, this, as you see, this court decision took about um, eight years to get through. And so what the countries did was they tweaked their law a bit. They said, oh, few people have access. We'll make them a few more logs. And so it's fine now. But in fact, you can now start a new lawsuit to say that the current version again violates human rights. And then eight years later, they will decide, indeed, it's the case. So this is, I find this amazing, actually, that our courts seem to be unable to enforce our fundamental rights because some politicians don't seem to be interested in that. Of course, they also collect your phone data. You may have heard about Code Traveler. It is interesting, especially for this audience, because Obama went on TV and said, we're going to stop collecting information on friends of friends of friends. We only collect information of friends of friends. Now, I'm afraid that after all my talks on Snowden, I'm now one of the people who may be of some interest. Okay? So I'm a f you're now in the room with me with your phone. So you're a friend of a friend. Welcome to the club. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you should actually have kept your phone at home. 
<laughs> I know, of course, Obama went on TV and said, it's only metadata, we're not listening to your calls. Okay, Verizon collected your metadata, it's only metadata. But then, a few months later, General Hayden gave a speech We said, we kill people based on metadata. <laughs> and then, but if you read the full speech, he says, but that's not what we do with this metadata. <laughs> Very good. So then, of course, there is the hacking. Um, we know that all our systems are full of bugs. We have worked on this, we get fewer bugs, but every new system has bugs. There is X bugs per thousand lines of code, and there is so many we have security critical, and we keep it pumping out new code, so we have zero days all the time. So, this has been used for many things. Get web companies of users to hack stuff. Mobile phones, I guess if you're in the business, um, sometimes I'm invited to go visit secret services. And so in the very long past, there would be a sign on the wall say, unplug the phone before the meeting starts. Because the phone was a fixed phone and everybody knew it could be eavesdropped remotely, so you had to unplug the phone. And then, of course, the mobile phone came. And then these guys, because they all know that you can turn any microphone, any mobile phone into a microphone, what they did was, even you switch it off, by the way. So what they did, these guys, was they put the phone on the table, took the battery out. And then the iPhone came. <laughs> so now they have boxes outside their building where you have to leave your phone. And they have a sign saying, we have mobile phone detection equipment. Okay, so. They do hack phones, and every phone you buy today has a baseband chip with the back door so that remotely any government official with the right access, the right clearance, whatever control, the NSA can listen to what's happening in your room. So if you have a private conversation, put your phone somewhere else. Okay, that's my advice. At Christmas 2014, I believe, the Spiegel released all the toys, hundreds and hundreds of toys of devices to hack hardware. Um, I'm not going to show all of them because it would take hours, but there is really cool stuff like this one called Rage Master. So it's a small chip inserted between your motherboard and your screen while your PC is being shipped to you. And then from 20 kilometers away, you can shine with a radar beam at the laptop to give it energy to power this chip, and then it will actually produce radiation that can be picked up, and so remotely they can see what's on your screen. I don't know if it's healthy if somebody shines a radio beam at your PC from 20 kilometers away. It may be very bad to get cancer. But maybe the next day there will be a Hellfire missile and you will not have cancer anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I don't know how that works. So here is something that made Cisco very upset. So this is the NSA people opening Cisco boxes um, in their offices to actually to intercept Cisco routers and to add an extra chip and then move it on. So I now know companies who go pick up all their boxes in person, no matter what it costs. Of course, a bit further, 2017, what we learned this year, in fact, that also the CIA is making hacking tools. Okay. What about poor governments in Europe? I mean, maybe the British, of course, they're in under cahoots with the Americans, but all these poor countries, especially the smaller ones, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Italy, what should they do? Well, there is companies that also make those tools. Okay, and one of them is Hacking Team. How do we know? Because Hacking Team was hacked and they lost all their data, all their customer lists. Which actually includes the police of UCSB, where crypto is held. If UCSB actually has tools to intercept SSL connections. Okay, so you can find out who is buying all those tools. This guy, this guy also have a very interesting slogan. They say, we believe that fighting crime should be easy. We provide effective, easy to use, offensive technology to the worldwide law. So to quote George Genesis, there is only one kind of country where fighting crime is easy. It's called the police state. Right? But so if you as a government don't have a budget to make those tools, then you can buy or you come to the hacking team and buy the tools from them. They may lose them occasionally. There is also other companies that just got hacked and that's why they're not so famous. So the NSA announced two years ago proudly that more than 90% of the zero days they find, they actually release to the public. They never said how quickly they released them. So but maybe in the early 90s, they found a small bug in Windows something called SMB something bug. And they only released it very recently, or maybe only recently because some Russian hackers actually hacked it away from them. And of course, they never say you what they do with the remaining 5% of the zero base, which they still keep close to their chest. Okay? So in fact, I'm not an expert in malware, but if you read stuff, you may 
conclude that actually the equation group, which is a group claimed to be a group of the NSA, actually was hacked by shadow brokers, which could be Russian hackers, and maybe some others, and that they found a zero day, which was then actually used to write WannaCry and Patch. And real businesses, like Maersk, were hit. There were companies in several, I mean, the real businesses, which hundreds and thousands of people had to do manual work to unload ships, tens of millions of dollars lost, all because the zero day of the NSA kept secret, released and then used by ordinary criminals, or maybe North Korea, we still don't know, but it's important to understand the consequence of what has been happening. So, switch to European policy scene. Um, I'm making now a fast forward and I'm going to discuss quickly about what about backdoors in encryption schemes and about hacking encryption schemes because this is relevant. So Europe has taken quite a strong stance. Both France and Germany have asked Europe to stop encryption. And they more or less following the FBI saying we, we are going dark, we need access. Okay? The British don't even ask them anymore because we know what their position is and we don't listen because of Brexit. <laughs> but the, the Commission said something very, very sensible. They said, Ansip, who is Vice President, I'm strongly against any backdoor to encrypted systems. Every time you Google this statement, you get a statement of Huawei. I don't know why, but that must be a coincidence. <laughs> but then, this is a new slide you may not have seen before. And so, a journalist drew my attention to this document, which was published last September, called Towards an Effective and Genuine Security. Okay. Okay. And there is some very good news in there. Encryption will not be prohibited, limited, or weakened. This is Ansi who wrote this sentence, or his staff. Measures should not have an impact on a larger or discriminate number of people. Okay. But then there is a not so good. There should be more collaboration between police forces. Europol gets 96 extra people to do what? To help the coordination of the creation of toolboxes with alternative investigation techniques. What is that? <laughs> So at, I hope that somebody from Europol will show up in the commission in two weeks and I can ask them what this actually is such a toolbox. What, is it zero days? Is it backdoors? Is it key search machines? I don't know. But so Europe actually, this is like, on the one hand it gives you the feel good factor, on the other hand you're like, oh no, what are we going to do? And you don't know what's going to end up in practice. The biggest question for me is, what will be the oversight on those toolboxes? If these guys find a zero day, who will check when it's released and to whom and at what moment and so on and so forth. Okay? So Microsoft actually, of all people, Microsoft gets worried after my stories about Quism and Skype. So this is more about the hacking, I think. So Brad Smith went on stage at the RSA conference uh, last February and actually he said, we need a digital Geneva Convention. This hacking is so bad, the Geneva Convention protects civilians in wartime. It says, for example, that you can't bomb hospitals. Of course, we know that the Syria has never happens, but or in Afghanistan, but officially, at least, if you bomb civilians or hospitals or schools in wartime, then actually you violate the Convention. And in some cases, depending on the regime you fall under, you can actually go to International Court for War Crimes. But of course, what's happening on the cyber world is that nation states are hacking civilians in peacetime. It's not even wartime. As far as I know, Belgium is not involved in the war. But civilians in Belgium, like operators in Belgacom, are still being hacked. So I think it's going really bad, and nobody knows how we should control this. And so it's a major problem to secure the infrastructure that nation states are investing hundreds of millions to actually find zero days and not tell the vendors, and then lose those tools. Or nation states are setting up companies or funding companies that collect zero days and then that lose those tools and then they're actually being used against us. Of course, there's much more happening. I don't have time, but there is the fifth or fourth order hacking. Um, this is a good one. And there was an investigation in German parliament. The British Navy police in Germany, they actually spied on German companies and gave the information to GCHQ in order to get access to tools of GCHQ. So your own government spies on your own companies and gives this to a foreign nation in exchange for access to a tool. Okay, there was an investigation in the German parliament about this, and that's politic.org went there and took notes. 
you can get the summary in CCC of um, last year. There was a very nice report, well, two years ago. So, this is a slide by George Yanesis, which actually help you understand why the Germans are so desperate. Because what's called tempera, it's GC2 system, and yet the US has something similar called excuse for deep dive. And how, at least, I thought intelligence work, and if you read books about how the NSA works and whatever, they have all the traffic they collect, satellite, cable, prism, whatever. It's hundreds of sources. And then they have selectors, like if you would say Osama bin Laden, or you would say nuclear bomb, or attack, or whatever, you mention certain things, your traffic will be picked out and put in a database. But of course, what Tempera does is much, much better. Okay. They actually have a ring buffer, which has three days of full internet traffic. I guess the unencrypted part of it. And then they do some clever analysis. I don't have time, so I'll skip it. But more or less, they use similar techniques as Google does. They learn from Google. Google does a good job in making information searchable. They have the same thing. And so more or less, they can now query all this stuff. So they, they use Google-like techniques, Hadoop stuff, all the good thing, to actually search this. And it also gives them new selectors. Uh, this is all very abstract. <coughs> so the next slide, again, largely credit to George Genesis, but I think it sends a very interesting picture of what this is, because it's the core of the debate. The debate is, can we collect everything to then search it? Because the NSA, you see, you see this is actually selective data collection. Well, this is, of course, massive data collection. So you had all these attacks in Paris, in Brussels, I guess in Germany over the past years. What do you find? You find one guy's phone that has not been crushed in the accident or the shooting or the explosion. You find one number. It's like a piece of a thread, and with the Tempera system, if you put this in the Tempera system, you can find all the phones that's ever been called, you can find all the MAC addresses, you can find the IP addresses, and so you can very un quickly unravel the whole network within seconds. And that's what BND was after. One phone number, you find everything. And that's what Tempera does. And of course, if you do the old way of surveillance, then you have this number, but all the traffic is gone. And anyway, you find only the numbers of this phone, and then you have to start searching again for the other phones. And so this system does it all at once, just like Google Search gives you all the information relevant at once. Yes? And this is why you shouldn't want to give your phone over to signal. It's very hard to, to hide it anyway. But sysadmins tend to collect MAC addresses in Excel sheets. With a temporal system, with one command, you can collect all Excel sheets with MAC addresses. Because they've been sent around, right? You can find, say, Panama's in the news, you might want to find all its portable machines. I guess if you have a Microsoft box, I don't want to pick on Microsoft, but sometimes the updates fail. Well, the NSA finds out before Microsoft. And so they now know you have an unpatched vulnerability, and so they can, can collect all the systems and find out which ones they can now enter. Or you can say, I want to find anybody in Switzerland who communicates in Danish and you use a symbol. Or even WhatsApp or whatever your favorite tool is. And they, they call this targeted surveillance. But that's the, the, the core of the debate, which you should explain to politicians and to other people, that with targeted surveillance, you can do those things. Well, mass surveillance, of course. But it's, they call this targeted surveillance, but it's first mass surveillance, which we then you can do horrible things, also very useful things. But I should not tell you how much you can abuse this one. You can also investigate everybody from a political party. You can also investigate somebody from a religion, or anybody from a religion. You can investigate anybody who comes to my talks. You know, it's all one search command. So it's not only the five eyes, as we call them, but of course, your nation is involved somehow as well. Right? So there is many networks. I'm not an expert on this, but if you think it's only the US or the UK, well, forget about it. Everybody is in there. I suspect that many other countries like Germany give their metadata or their data to GCHQ or the NSA in exchange for searches. And why do we know it for Germany? Because the Snowden leaked the document about Germany. The Germans were unlucky. And maybe the French got away with it and the Belgians. So I'm still trying to find more evidence. Japan is here too. Japan also collaborates. So I think what's very interesting, there was this debate before about industry versus government and Europeans trust the government and um, Americans tend to trust industry more. But I think industry has changed and we have now big data, all the data in the cloud. We have the 
IOP, and we have all the advertising ecosystem. This is already what we have on a large scale today, already for 10 years, um, and this is coming up. And then we have the PRISM program. So the PRISM program actually is very aptly named. It gives the government a PRISM on all this data. So if your data is in the cloud or is in the IoT systems or in the advertising system, the government can go and ask for the PRISM program. So it's completely irrelevant whether data is selected by industry or by government because the government has access anyway. I think that's the core of the debate, that the loser in this scenario is the user. Because now government has lost the incentive to stop industry collecting data. And of course, in Europe, we have GDPR, but there is the exception for law enforcement and intelligence, national security in general. Right? And so it may still be better in Europe than anywhere else. And if you use law of encryption, it may be harder to use PRISM, but still the core of the debate remains. So what we created, I think you have to be very realistic about this, is something called, in 1791, so research about privacy is actually older, it was not called privacy, but research about surveillance, um, called Panopticon, which is a prison in this shape. So there is a central tower, and the prisoners are watched all the time. And the idea was, there was a philosophy behind this, is if you're watched all the time, you will not deviate from appropriate behavior for a prisoner. There is only one country that built two such prisons. Should I ask you which one? The UK, of course. They built two of them, and the prisoners didn't like it. Strange enough. Now, that sounds like very far away, and this is all this. Is the, the prisons were built in the 19th century. But actually, when I grew up, and you can guess how old I am, so in the 80s, I was told stories about a really bad country was Eastern China. You know, there was the movie, that's living as unknown. Everybody was spying on everybody else. This was the most horrible society where the government was spying on everybody else. This was really the bad guys, and we were the good guys. We would not do this. Well, I think with the current surveillance, we have something the Stasi could only dream of. <laughs> Today, in fact, we built such a society where the government can do all of this, much more than the Stasi ever could, because they don't have to bribe anybody on the blackmail. They just get all the information through those devices here, right? And because we use those phones and we use the internet. And I guess we were told that it was not nice to live in East Germany, but apparently we're told it's great to live in our current society. And we all, the NSA, even as a slide, will say, is saying iPhone users are actually zombies who pay for their own surveillance. Right? And Android users is the same, of course. So what are the lessons learned? Um, economy of scale, which means you can only do this if you're big enough. If you're a small nation, you have to play with the big ones. So don't underestimate such a government. In fact, I did talk to, to large companies about this problem, and pre Snowden, the company said, oh, we don't care about governments. But like in the financial sector, they don't say this anymore. And then these are actually the guys who now go pick up their Cisco routers in person and try to ask me or other people to find backdoors in their routers and try to see whether they can source something and use maybe two technologies on top of each other so that there is a Chinese backdoor and an American backdoor, but together they don't work. And so some companies are getting worried about this. If you think it's just about collecting data, no, it's about actually hacking the infrastructure. I think that's something we should explain better and better to the broader society. That this is the core problem. I mean, master base is already bad enough, but then to do this, they actually also destroy the infrastructure. Okay? So it's not about communication security, how important encryption may be, it's actually about the end systems, because that's where the problem is. And of course, how to solve this, I don't know. We'll have to think about it. So, Let's go quickly about the crypto, because it's a crypto workshop. So after three months, the Bullman program was leaked, which more or less says the NSA uses a range of tricks to go after encryption. So we thought that we won the crypto wars, quite summarized. We thought that now there was free export, and there was no more limitation on crypto. It was not easier. But so many tricks were used. So of course, if you can't get the plain text, just ask for the key. Okay. This is something which is clear from Snowden documents. Um, that you can do is with national security letters. So this is the third way the NSA has access or had access to Google data. You can just ask for the decryption key of all SSL sessions. Right? I don't know whether they ever did this, but it could have been an interesting scenario for them. We can all agree on that. Okay? So if you get such a letter, it says give up your key. It also says if you speak about this letter, you go to jail. The CEO goes to jail. If you don't do what it says, you also go to jail. 
But if it's only one thing you can do is shut down your company. I don't think the CEO of Google will shut down his company if he gets such a letter, or Microsoft, or Apple, or whatever. It's just too much money involved. Right? So we know that 300,000 have been issued of those letters in 2001. Okay, and only a few have been fought in court. As a company, you can go to court and fight the gag order and say, the judge, I want to talk about this at least. I want to give the data, but at least I want to talk, inform my customers. So we know Lavabit, he shut down his company. It was an email provider to, to Snowden. He shut down his company because his company was small. was probably not a great business. But most people, of course, don't do this. And there is some indications, like Silent Circle, they were setting up some post-Snowden encryption, and suddenly they shut down the encryption. We don't know. They can't talk about this, but that was very bizarre. Maybe this was also a cultural situation. Okay, so many people make fun of Yahoo, but at least Yahoo is one of the few companies that fought such a gap order and fought the security order. Or you can just steal the key. Okay, so I would not name any names, but there happens to be a company on my slide which you can all read. <laughs> so it turns out that, of course, the French state insisted that all keys for GSM would be available. Maybe you should wait till the next slide. The recording will be online. I've given it to So, this is long before Snowden. It actually um, was very well known if you drank with the right people some beers that mobile phone companies, the SIM card companies, gave copies of all keys to their government. What happened then is actually I told this story over another beer to somebody with access to Snowden documents and they went to search for those companies and they found that the British had hacked the interface of the French. <laughs> so in fact, the French government wanted those keys, but then they had to be available somewhere for download, also to the operators, they were not encrypted. And the British found this interface and they hacked it and so they got all the keys from the Okay. This is a program which they keep track of all SSL keys called Flying Pig. Of course, keys can be obtained in many ways, and so, like asking for them, this is the reason why in November 2013, Google and Microsoft almost simultaneously switched to Diffie Hellman from RSA, because in Diffie Hellman <laughs> there was no long-term sequence to encrypt the key. And so this was something which was in the books for a long time, but suddenly with Snowden it was possible, and within four or five months, actually, Google and <coughs> Microsoft bit the bullet and actually rolled out Diffie Hellman, slowed down their systems, to actually stop um, the, this way of asking for the key, because in the case of the you can't ask, well, you can ask for a key, but you can only impersonate future sessions, so you cannot read past sessions, okay? Um, then we discovered about the downgrade attack. So all the SSL and TLS implementations today still support 512-bit, so you can go in the middle, tell the parties to use 512-bit, in real time break the key, and then nobody will notice. This attack was published two years ago. Here you see the distribution of SSL key sizes, which I pulled down yesterday. So you see that 1024 is now less than 30%, so it's getting better. Uh, but there is still several percentage using 512-bit keys, which you can actually break in less than an hour, right? So and you still have problem. If you come with the private key, replace the public key. If it's your public key, you know the private key, right? <laughs> so how you do this? Well. We all know that the SSL ecosystem was not very good. Uh, there were studies pre-Snowden, there were 12 million servers. Um, many people were caught attacking them. Many SSL certificate providers were actually hacked. Um, and then afterwards, Google installed things like pinning and certificate transparency and so on. And in fact, they called the Turkish, they called the French, they called the Chinese, they called Symantec, all issuing false certificates for Google and for other players. But this was only post-Snowden you can be sure that those attacks existed for a long time already, and they still exist today, uh, and sometimes they're not. Okay? So it's not very good there, and if you use a mobile phone, it also trusts 650 routes. If you use a publisher browser, it trusts 650 routes, and the CIA is in there, probably. They have been in there, they're probably in there again. They bought a company to do some shady stuff. Um, the Chinese government is in there, the Turkish government, the French government, all your friends are in there. So in fact, you should go to your browser and delete all those keys. But I mean, good luck, right? And every time you update, they probably put back and so on. So uh, it, I think it's almost deliberate. It's hard to manage this as a user. You cannot say who you trust. It's actually you have to manually go in and delete who you don't trust. There is some good news. Let's encrypt issues free certificates. As was mentioned by Christiana this morning. Um, it took us from 93 to 2017 to get to 12 million SSL certificates. 
on public servers, they got in two years another 40 million servers. By giving free certificates, they more or less got four times more traction. So you see, this was actually funded by companies, but most of it, but also supported by academics who had probably the idea around the beer. And so you see, you can do something. A small initiative, it doesn't solve all problems, but like Mozilla reports now that more than 65% of internet traffic over Mozilla is encrypted. So it's sometimes achieving your goal in some part, of course. It doesn't solve everything, there is still metadata, but <coughs> things can be done. I think that's a, an example of something good that can be done with little money. And the back doors. So this work goes back to Adam Young and Moti Young. They actually published a series of papers in the late 90s called Kleptography. They later renamed it Crypto Virology. Um, that shows how easy it is to backdoor discrete lock systems in particular. But of course, you, they also had RSA variants, but discrete lock, one of the curves are particularly suitable for this. I think people accepted those papers, but they kind of smiled a bit at them. But of course, some people in Maryland read those papers with great interest and implemented them. As Michael says, if you implement stuff, you learn stuff. <laughs> so what did they do? They made a trapdoor so that if you have the seed, and then you have this machine, the number generator actually produces keys, but in all protocols, it also produces nonsense, right? The challenge response. And if you look at IPsec or SSL, in fact, this nonce is put in clear over the line. So if there is a trapdoor in this device here, if you first pick up the nonce, you can then discover with the trapdoor the state, and then you can predict the session keys. That's the math. You can figure out the math in the papers. So more or less, the NSA did that. So the standard is called dual EC DRBG, and this standard was developed in ANSI in a very close community, community where Microsoft was involved, um, Certicom was involved, NIST was involved, and the NSA was involved. They drafted the standard. Then they fast tracked it into ISO, where nobody paid attention. Suddenly, the US comments on a draft of 10 pages were a 112 page new draft. And this suddenly, in two years, became a standard. And then NIST said, oh, now we have to make it a standard too. So, and nobody paid attention. Um, so this is a. PRNG, where if you have a secret key, you know, this grid log, you can actually, from one output, you can predict session keys produced by the starting Okay? So there is papers describing the attack, the NSA says, oh, the attack is not practical, but you can read the papers and judge for yourself. And then comes the Juniper story. So some Juniper actually gave an update to their net screen operating system. And then people started to reverse engineer what the update was. And what they discovered was that Juniper had a backdoor based on dual EC, and that somebody had taken over the backdoor. Something the programmers have always been warning before, but so it actually happened in real life. Of course, Juniper never admitted this. But so also the backdoor was claimed to be disabled, but due to a subtle bug, this backdoor was not disabled. By making small changes in the code, some things didn't work as expected, so the dual EC had to go to another random engineer, but it never happened. But so the most important thing is there is a real live example of a backdoor taken over by somebody else, and we still don't know by who. And the other thing is Juniper still keeps shipping tough stuff. They kind of never been punished for having a backdoor in there in the first place. They lost the backdoor, they put it back. The original backdoor is now in there, as far as you know. If you buy this product, it still has the original backdoor. Not the not the change. Very interesting stuff. I recommend reading you this. This is all real, right? This is kind of things cryptographers are at crypto, imagining over a beer, but this actually has all now been happened um, and it's been documented in the literature. So this slide is very intriguing. So it actually shows the key exchange mechanism and then the turmoil program. So the turmoil program actually um, allows the NSA to, if it's ciphertext, it principally goes to Utah, but the NSA can actually decrypt it in real time in many cases, maybe based on the back door. Or it goes to this program here, long haul, which is actually is high performance computing. So maybe it's factoring RSA <coughs> keys, maybe it's discrete log, maybe some other stuff we don't know. But this slide is quite interesting and it shows that seven years ago, uh, the NSA could decrypt 20,000 VPN connections per hour um, using all kinds of weaknesses. So I think it's very interesting to show that because not only these backdoors were actually operationalized and they have the advantage that they would use the storage environments for Utah. Because if you can decrypt something in real time, you don't have to send it to Utah for future decryption. Okay? So, 
So what are the problems? And if you are a crypto implementer, what should you pay attention to? There is many implementations, many problem with implementations. They go after keys to make sure there is not one key the NSA can ask for or some other government can ask for. Okay. Undermining standards, so be very careful when there's a proposal coming from governments. And maybe they break stuff, we don't know. Having complex standards is also perfect for the NSA. If you look at IPsec, the first version was 48 documents. It took six years to write. And then it took another five years to simplify it to still several hundred and hundreds of pages. So this is a dream for the NSA because the likelihood that the secure IPsec implementation exists is quite small, and all the research has been gone into TLS and SSL, and OpenSSL, but IPsec comparatively has much less interest, also much less deployment, and it's hard to say. Export control still have effect, um, hardware backdoors, zero days, and then if you can't deal with things anymore, then send in Comey or the FBI and say, oh, we're going dark, please give us more backdoors. That's more or less a picture. So what is hard? Go to Snowden documents. TrueCrypt, they found annoying. PGV, they found annoying. Um, Tor, Tor stinks. They, they write about it. And also ZRP, which is the predecessor of Signal, um, they didn't like. So it means it's something you should like. Um, and they're all open source, end to end, limited user base, um, and they use standard crypto. But apparently, from indirect consequences, in the look at the documents, it seemed that at least a few years ago they could not print this. So that's a good news. The bad news, of course, is that those things are not deployed. And so now this is the story I want to tell. So when I started in crypto, this is 87. They were actually secret string ciphers, mostly Swiss companies. Um, there was some crypto, and they sold crypto to governments with backdoors, as we know from the books that appeared in the 90s, American backdoors. So there was nothing new. But the users were governments <coughs> and banks, and that was it. There were probably less than a million crypto devices in the world, and there was no crypto in the hands of users. It was very hard to do it. I mean, when RSA was invented, it couldn't be implemented. Revest tried for several years to build an RSA chip, and in the end, they gave up because they couldn't do it. The tools were not ready to build a 512-bit RSA chip. And then we saw a mass explosion. So today, there is more than 30 billion crypto devices. So people have encryption. But do we have security? Well, 18 billion of those devices are there to, I would say, protect the interest of industry. So this is 6 billion bank cards, 6 billion access cards. There is update mechanism. Of course, you can argue a secure update helps you. So this is why I don't make it completely red. So it actually has also your bank card, protects your money as well, your access card. But of course, the main goal of an access card is to protect your company against rogue intruders. Or the main reason for a secure update is also to keep control of your device so you can't remove the DRM software or hack the DRM software. And in fact, if a secure update comes and you like five patches, not a sixth one, there is no option if it comes in one package to say which ones you don't want. Because the signature is on the whole thing. And you don't decide what you get. So there is, in fact, you, as a user, you have no control over an update. You can install it or not install it. You cannot say, I'm going to install this part and not that part. That's not how it works. Of course, the worst thing, and most money in crypto was made in the 90s, was with DRM, with preventing you from copying bits. Because copying bits, obviously, is very bad. So it's really bad for the movie stars and the singers. The singers have kind of given up. They allow copying bits. The movie stars still make so much money that they don't want you to copy bits. And they're even too willing to go after W3C, as you've heard um, yesterday, and because you should not be copying bits. This is really something bad because it will kill an industry. And so about 2.4 billion devices exist with crypto to prevent you from copying bits. Mm -hmm. Same for game consoles, identity cards, and readers. So you see that most of the crypto is, this is not there to protect users, so I don't give it a green call. So what is there to protect user data? Well, the biggest market is mobile phones. The encryption between your mobile phone and your base station. This is encrypted only for the wireless part. So it's not end-to-end. -end. So the government can go and intercept it at the base station or base station control. And there is now this encryption. There is a yes now, but it's not end-to-end. -end. Okay, fail. The next big thing is the SSL TLS ecosystem. So I think there is three to four billion browsers or browsing devices. Oh no, it's now switching to an app ecosystem, but probably with similar numbers, right? And then there is like this 50 million servers. I still give it a red color. I think as a 
is of course harder than clear text. It's encrypted, but as a motivated opponent, you can still intercept it. There are companies that sell products to insert root keys in your browsers of your employees so they can actually intercept their Facebook usage and their Google Gmail usage and their all other applications. This is a commercial product available. These guys come to crypto conferences or the RSA conferences, really come, they sell this product too. We're going to subvert the browsers of all your users and you will be able to eavesdrop on all your users. Right? This, so I guess it should maybe, it's getting better with TLS 1.3, maybe it's going, something's getting better, but still I think we failed as a community. The web is kind of secure, but then not clear. Okay? So, some other thing is Skype. I, I guess I call that wet. I guess you know why. Um, hard disk encryption. Most of you have hard disk encryption. Which means that all your bits on your hard disk are encrypted. What happens if you pull out the hard disk and put it in a different machine? Have you ever tried this? It works. So, in fact, if, the, if you have a consumer-grade version of a product, the hard disk encryption comes without key management, which means that <laughs> the hard disk will give its data to any device you plug it in. It's improving with BitLocker. If you want to install BitLocker, you're okay, but then you have to trust Microsoft, which you may or may not want to do, but still a large number of users have encryption on their hard disk, which means if their hard disk gets corrupted, they can't read out the data anymore, but they don't have security because if they come at the border and they have an encrypted disk, well, it just works in any other system. So now we come to the interesting part. So Ashley was happy about WhatsApp and iMessage, I guess. Yes, right, indeed, it's encrypted, but of course the <coughs> metadata is still available. And that's why Facebook did it. It was for PR, I think, to have less to do with law enforcement. But in the end, they have the metadata. And again, I don't use those things, but I am told that the default is that there is still a clear backup in the cloud. You can switch it off, but most users don't. And if it's in the cloud, it goes to Prism. <coughs> So in fact, it's fantastic because everybody's happy to have end-to-end end -end -end WhatsApp. Facebook has all the metadata, the NSA has all the metadata, plus if they really want to have the message, they can have it. And then everybody's happy about encryption. Okay. So where we see better points is actually <coughs> those devices, and as we've seen in the, the fight with the FBI against Apple and also Android, it's getting better. The new Android devices are getting better encryption, the new iPhones are getting better encryption. So this is the only place where we're winning. But of course, then these devices leak all our information anyway to all the apps and the advertising and, and whatever. So it's kind of a Pyrrhus victory, right? Our data is encrypted, but we broadcast it anyway. So, of course, I can take the blame. This is my generation of cryptographers and all my colleagues from my generation. We built this crypto ecosystem. We made, some of us got rich. I didn't, but some got rich. Some made a nice career, but we didn't give people secure crypto. And I think the next generation should fix this. And single is a start. Um, there is other good developments, um, but I think we should redo this, build secure infrastructure, secure end systems, and start doing it. It's possible with cryptography to do it properly, but of course the temptations are very big because what happens is usually if you get something which gets more than 20 or 30 million users, you will be bought by a large corporation which will put in the necessary law enforcement features or whatever you want to call it, so you have to either decide to put in a not-for-profit or take the money, but then you know that you now give up your users. And as we know, all people, most people actually give in for the temptation. Once you offer enough zeros, the one in front, you will actually give up your users and say, what the hell with it? Um, I'm going to be rich. I will sell identity-based encryption. Yeah. Even if it's a government backdoor or whatever, I wouldn't take my money. Okay, that, I think that's uh, the problem we are facing. Companies, after Snowden, they're more incentivized to solve this problem, but of course to some extent only, because if you lift up the data, as you've heard from, from Dan Bogdanov, if you lift the data, you may not want to like solutions where the data is taken away from you. Okay. So, I'll be very brief because we run out of time. I don't think all the problems are solved. I just want to say two more things. <coughs> it's about the architecture. Architecture is both. It's really the core of it, are our systems peer-to-peer -peer or centralized? And I think we're starting to understand how to build decentralized systems, but it's actually a problem. How do you make systems which are almost as good as what Google does and Apple does and Facebook does, but decentralized? And in social networks, there was the Aspera, it's a big fail. It doesn't work. And I mean, this is a challenge. Can we build something which is almost as good, but then decentralized? And I think that's a challenge. Can we use all the fancy crypto we have now, MPC, distributed systems, 
I mean, peer to peer, Skype actually worked, right? Why don't we make a new Skype? It can be a build. I mean, the technology is available. I have some source code of Skype if you want. I mean, I have some, I have some code of Skype where all the checks are removed for the formation hackers. So there you can find what they did. Right? You can actually basically reverse engineer it and build a new Skype. And this time, not sell it to the US government. And you may improve the crypto. Anyway, so but I think the core point is, it's not about adding encryption, it's about changing the architecture. Because if you're going to give up all the metadata and going to give up on the control, it's going to go bad. Anyway. And we also know from all the breaches that if people who collect a lot of data, they also lose it on a large scale. Right? Look at Equifax, look at uh, the security data of some, all the people in the US with security clearances, all their data was lost. So large corporations, and I think Google and Facebook and Microsoft have been quite good, but at some moment they may be breached, and then all this data gets lost. A society should we take this risk? Or should we maybe, I was actually very happy to see this home system. I mean, that's the kind of system I would like to have, right? Where your data is backed up with your friends. And I mean, you see the solutions exist, but we don't have them. So build them and maybe educate people that this is how we should do stuff. And not everything in the cloud. And give up some features, but actually get more robust. Okay, then I'll skip the details. One more slide. I think we need to go to open systems. And I know that this is not how Apple was built, or Microsoft was built, or Facebook was built. But if you look at all the backdoors and the zero days, the only way to make sure there is no government backdoors or zero days where you don't know about what to do about it is by having open systems. Apparently, I can explain this well because I went to the European Parliament and they listened to me and they funded security audits of open source security software. Apparently, I'm a very bad convincer because they gave them one and a half million euro. I've, it's just an order of three orders of magnitude off. Right? I should have asked for one and a half billion, but I was so stupid not to give an amount, and then the politicians thought that one and a half million would be enough. And I'm now told that they're going to give a second program, another one and a half million euro. So somebody should tell them, who is a better speaker than me, that it's not one and a half million. Okay? They should invest hundreds of millions in orbiting and developing secure open source infrastructure. If we don't have routers with backdoors, we don't have DNS maybe with backdoors, all the other infrastructure, we should have open infrastructure where we can all rely on it. Okay? So, time to stop here. I hope I didn't bore you too much. But if you have solutions, rethink the architecture. We should develop crypto for the people. Right? It's possible. People have done it. So it's actually possible to do it. You will maybe not get very rich. Maybe you get a bit famous. But that's what we should do as a community. We need open technologies, and of course we can use all the advanced stuff, um, maybe not to split one server into three to make it more secure, but actually to really have the serious crypto and to avoid that your data falls in the hands of the one. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.